Hello and welcome to the next conversation with Giants in Medicine, hosted by the Journal of Clinical Investigation. I'm Ushma Neal. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. William Paul, NIH Distinguished Investigator and Chief of the Laboratory of Immunology within the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Paul is an immunologist best known for discovery of the cytokine interleukin-4 and the description of its, both its receptor and the associated signaling mechanisms. He was also a very important contributor to various immunological topics from describing CD4 T-cell differentiation, lymphocyte dynamics, and B-cell biology. Now you've been described to me as the consummate physician scientist and a terrific mentor, so I really look forward to hearing about your path through science. Well, I'll do my best. To, I hope I won't disappoint. <laughs> do you think you could start at the very beginning and talk to me a little bit about where you grew up and what you were like as a kid? Well, it's, what I was like as a kid was probably better for others to say, but where I grew up I can certainly tell you. So I was born in uh, Brooklyn, New York City. My father had a small business, an automobile repair business. Um, we lived in Brooklyn uh, until uh, almost the time I was finishing high school when we moved to Queens, but I came back to Brooklyn for college, and I was at Brooklyn College where I must say I became very interested in science, uh, but uh, as not unusual in uh, oldest boys in Jewish families, the notion of being a doctor was very prominent in my parents' mind. And uh, being a relatively dutiful son, I pursued that, but always feeling that the greatest accomplishment one might have would be to make a small contribution to the advancement of science. And in that era, I guess I wasn't so ambitious. The notion that you could just make a little contribution seemed to me a great thing. Uh, so college was fine. Uh, Brooklyn College gave an excellent education, but not very much opportunity for independent work. I went to medical school also in Brooklyn at Downstate Medical Center, which um, had its uh, strengths and weaknesses. It, one of its great strengths was a uh, chairman of pharmacology who arrived when I was starting our pharmacology course. Uh, continued to work at Downstate and uh, 30 or so years later, working essentially by himself, discovered that nitric oxide was really important. His name was Robert Furchgott and at the time he was the only faculty member of a New York City medical school with a Nobel Prize, which was very unusual considering where Downstate is usually in the pecking order of New York City medical schools. But that was a good experience, and I worked summers in a lab uh, with a very nice man, a man named George Talbert. He was interested in um, uh, protein hormones, most particularly pituitary hormones, and we worked on the development of pituitary, a growth hormone uh, in the rat pituitary. Um, we didn't do anything shockingly uh, 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 new. But it was a really great experience. It got me interested in science. It taught me things. And George's uh, recommendation helped me get an NIH job, which was not a trivial thing at the time. So where did you transition for your medical residency? So I went at, was at Downstate. I was a good student. I am better in college than medical school. Um, I wasn't a fantastic doctor. You know, many people just a, a bit of an aside, you know, f being a good physician is a remarkable accomplishment. It combines deep scientific knowledge, but it also combines a, a ability to perceive a patient in a unique way. And some people have that gift, and I know many of them, and I admire them greatly. I wish I could say I had that gift, but I don't believe I did. So I worked dreadfully hard at being um, a house officer. I uh, hope I did well, uh, I think so, but I still realized the gap in the abilities of, these weren't scientific abilities, I probably knew as much as any of them, but I could sense that there is a, uh, an aspect of medicine as distinct from science which is very uh, distinctive in an individual and those who have it are really remarkable people. 
So during this residency, you started doing some work on, work on the structural components of amyloid fibrils right. that ended up getting published right. in Nature. Right. So clearly you started with quite a scientific bent. So was that part of what shaped you that research was going to be more important than clinical aspects for you? Well, I always, had, I always felt very attracted to science, and even in medical school, uh, I was extremely attracted to science. Um, I ended up doing my internship and assistant residency at what was then called Massachusetts Memorial Hospital. It was the principal teaching hospital of BU. It had a very distinguished faculty uh, for a very small hospital. Um, amongst the most well-known people there were Franz Engelfinger uh, and Arnold Relman, both successive editors of the New England Journal of Medicine, and both real true giants true giants. And so it was a very small hospital, four assistant residents, uh, six or seven uh, interns in medicine. Uh, when I became an assistant resident, there were four of us, but two were drafted, so two of us had to run the whole service. But they had a very nice uh, program that allowed you to have a month off during your assistant residency when you could do research. And I had wanted to work on uh, uh, steroid hormones, but the group there wasn't very interested. And I had met a new recruit to Mass Memorial who had just come from Mass General, a man named Alan Cohn, who was a great expert in amyloidosis. This is the true amyloidosis in which people develop these enormous infiltrations of amyloid fibrils in their livers. And, and Alan was very interested in this, and uh, he needed people to work in his lab since he was just setting up and he was willing to tolerate an unskilled uh, but enthusiastic uh, assistant resident. So I spent my month with him, and then for the rest of the year I worked nights. And what we did today would be seem simple and straightforward, but the question at the time was, to what extent was, were amyloid fibrils composed of immunoglobulins or antibodies? And uh, Alan and I thought we could solve that problem by using a recent advance in electron microscopy in which you could tag antibodies with ferritin and that would make them visible within the electron microscope. And that technology had just been developed by a man named John Singer and I'd read John's papers and I was able to carry out the reactions and make my ferritin labeled antibodies and I could prove they worked because we had a control and the antibodies we had did not bind to amyloid fibrils. Now, subsequently, there is evidence, in fact, that denatured immunoglobulin is, is incorporated, but of course our antibodies would not have detected that. That paper got published in Science, I mean, I'm sorry, in Nature, small error. Uh, today, I doubt it would have, <laughs> but at the time, Nature was a somewhat less formidable journal than it is today. And uh, we published a longer paper in the American Journal of Pathology, and that really got me on my way. So Alan uh, asked me, um, after I had received my NIH appointment, that I come back to BU when I was finished and join his uh, fledgling rheumatology group, which I thought was a great idea. Uh, so in the interval, I had um, applied to the National Institutes of Health uh, to uh, join the United States Public Health Service as a commissioned officer where I could on the one hand fulfill my military obligation and on the other hand have the opportunity to work uh, in what would, was and would be just the most remarkable place to do both basic and clinical science. And when you were there you started working on things like metastatic choriocarcinoma right. and the radioimmunoassay right. for thyroid right. Stimulating hormone. Right. So what happened was uh, getting positions was still quite difficult, and um, I had a recommendation from uh, George Talbert uh, because I had worked with him on protein hormones, and the uh, there were several protein hormone groups, um, and the one in the NCI headed by Roy Hertz chose me, which of course I was enormously grateful for. And what Roy was famous for, he was of course a well-known uh, 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 individual interested in clinical aspects of pituitary disease um, 
and he became very interested in choriocarcinoma, which is, as you will know, a malignancy of the trophoblast, relatively unusual in the Western world, but quite common elsewhere. And it was known that occasionally women who had metastatic choriocarcinoma would have miraculous remissions in which the tumors would fade away. Why that was true was never adequately answered, but Roy became very interested. And with colleagues, one of many, M.C. Lee, who had moved subsequently to Sloan Kettering, devised the treatment of this metastatic disease with methotrexate. And remarkably, 70% of the women who would come to the service, most of these women having metastatic disease, which was not trivial. If you looked at their chest x-rays, they would have infiltrations the size of grapefruits. Treated with methotrexate, 70% of them, the tumors would regress and disappear. And we had two remarkable things. We had a drug that was terrific, and we had the most remarkable bioassay for the tumor because the tumor was making choreo, um, no, excuse me, give me a moment, <coughs> chorionic gonadotropin, which is a relative, of course, of the other gonadotropins. And we had both biological assays, mainly bioassays for chorionic gonadotropin that were incredibly sensitive. So we could follow the tumor even after it was no longer visible. And when a woman was no longer positive for CGA, she was judged likely to have been cured. And these were true cures. Many of these women uh, went on to have subsequent children. Uh, it was the most remarkable clinical experience one can possibly have. Uh, I still remember to this day uh, that we would have uh, these women come in uh, uh, and, and we would uh, be able to send most of them home. But of course the tragedy was we couldn't send them all home. But still you could not have asked for a more fulfilling opportunity as a clinician scientist. And yet it did not motivate you to stay in that field. So what motivated you to pivot towards a more immunological course? Well, so I had worked with Alan on um, using immunological methods to study amyloidosis. But also, at some stage, and it's difficult for me to remember exactly when, probably when I was either in college or medical school, I came into possession of a very slender volume of essays by a man named Michael Heidelberger. Heidelberger had been the professor of uh, immunology and microbiology at PNS for his, virtually his entire career. He was responsible for the development of quantitative methods to study antibody antigen interactions, to put immunology in a sense on a scientific footing. And he wrote so vividly about the remarkable capacity of antibodies and antigens to interact with this enormous specificity that I was just completely taken with that idea. So that, together with my work with Alan, which was a practical application, made me feel I really wanted to do immunology. So even though I was in a um, protein hormone group, uh, the research I did all turned on the immunological properties of protein hormones. The most notable piece of work was work that was really led by uh, the man who was my mentor in this, Bill O'Dell, and we had a second colleague, John Wilbur, and uh, they probably made more contributions than I did to this, but we developed the radioimmunoassay for thyroid stimulating hormone. At the time, I believe it was the third such assay. The first, of course, the groundbreaking work by Solomon Burson and Rosalind Yallo, for which Rosalind won a Nobel Prize Saul Burson having died in the interval, where they developed a radioimmunoassay for insulin. And then they followed that up with growth hormone, and that was done by them with Jesse Roth, who had been a postdoc. And I came to know Jesse well because he came to NIH at the same time I did. And I believe Bill O'Dell and John Wilbur and my work on TSH was probably the third time that radioimmunoassays had been used in a manner that would allow you to measure these very important protein hormones. But in addition to that, I worked on the immunological properties of um, uh, melanocyte stimulating hormone, uh, ACTH. We used uh, some unusual techniques to try to measure the size of these molecules, both their 
immunological size and their protein size. And all in all, I had a very good experience, terrific in many respects. Although I did feel I wasn't getting a true scientific background. That is, pretty much I was teaching myself these techniques. No one in the group was immunologically oriented. Uh, so I felt I was doing interesting things, worthwhile. I got a, I think there was um, a Nature paper, I think, that came out of that as well. But nonetheless, I didn't feel that I was in the mainstream of immunology. And that motivated me to say, well, I really need to get training in, in this field. And I had actually um, begun to think that way, actually, even before I came to NIH. So I was still in Alan Cohn's lab and doing my assistant residency. He suggested I talk to a couple of immunologists in Boston. Uh, one uh, very famous man named Byron Waxman, who subsequently moved to Yale and was the head of immunology there for many years, and the other a man named Sid Leskowitz. And they both counseled me and said they're the two really most exciting places in the United States to do immunology today. That was today being 1961, <laughs> were uh, Baruch Ben Asraf's laboratory at New York University School of Medicine and Henry Kunkel's laboratory at the Rockefeller Institute, or was just becoming the Rockefeller University. So, based on our advice, I applied to both, uh, both of these stellar individuals. Um, and I got interviews with both of them, one on a Friday and one on a Monday. And it just by chance happened that that was the weekend of the culmination of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I still remember this vividly. But I saw Henry on a Friday. He was very cordial. But he explained that his laboratory was full. If I wanted to apply to the graduate school to get a PhD, he said he possibly could squeeze me in. But by then, you know, I was out of medical school for several years. Uh, my wife and I had a son. I really was a little reluctant to consider undertaking uh, a PhD, although Marilyn, my wife, said sh I should do it. But I didn't think this was the greatest idea. And on Monday, I went to see Baruch at NYU. And now, Kunkel was, of course, by then, the true establishment figure. Uh, ben Asraf, by contrast, was a brash young man on the way up. Uh, although, uh, looking at him, you would not have uh, uh, reached that conclusion. He was short and somewhat overweight, uh, spoke with a high-pitched voice, but that belied a tower of strength. <laughs> so Baruch interviewed me, and he sent me around to all his colleagues, some very good people, and at the end of the day, we talked, and he said, said, well, he would think about it, and I went on home, and two weeks later, a letter arrived saying that I could join his group. But I was a little uncertain about what that meant, because I had seen Jeanette Torbecker, who was really great scientist, and Zoltan Ovari, and several other people. So I, I, I screwed up my courage, and I wrote to Baruch, do you mean I can work with you, <laughs> or do I have to work with some of those others? So he wrote back and said I could work with him. However, I should know that he was going to take a sabbatical next year. So, well, that may be, it may have been, that was an issue. But nonetheless, we resolved that we would do that. So you returned to New York. I returned to New York. Ben Asraf never took the sabbatical. <laughs> and I arrived in his uh, lab. I can remember the date, July 1st, 1964. I can remember walking in the door and discovering nobody was there. <laughs> They'd all gone on vacation. <laughs> Baruch was in Paris for a month. He always did that. He, um, he had grown up in Paris, and his uh, wife was French, and they had a home in Paris, and he was a, from a wealthy family. So he was always away for a month or more in the summer. Most of the postdocs had disappeared, and it was me and one other. But we had a grand time, and that started uh, the most remarkable experience of my life, I have to say. So what did you focus on when you were in the Banasareff lab, and how did he help shape your views on science yeah. and how to tackle a scientific problem? Well, let's start with the second, if I may. So Baruch is, of course, you know, a Nobel laureate. Um, he was a very smart man, 
But I've met a lot of very smart people, and uh, I, I can say this today, I wouldn't have said it before his death, because I have the greatest admiration for him. He treated me as a son. He was smart, very smart, but there are a lot of very smart people, and probably equal to him. But he had a wonderful intuition for an experiment. He could understand what you had to do to prove a point, and he could do it. And in my view, that was uh, a much more important trait of his than his great intellect. Uh, indeed, that's what I admired most in him, that the idea that simple experiments could have enormous uh, impact. Um, and the other thing which most people who will have known him would be surprised at, uh, he, he encouraged uh, controversy within the lab. Uh, you were free to uh, contradict, you raise your voice, even yell, <laughs> in the lab. Outside the lab, by contrast, you know, that was not allowed. You know, in other words, we, uh, we wouldn't contradict one another, you know, which was a reasonable thing. But there was no notion of squelching scientific inquiry. But we did portray to the outside world a single face. So I admired that as well, that, you know, here was, I was just, you know, starting a postdoc. He was a great man. In fact, for a year I had great difficulty for how to figure out how to address him, because he insisted I not call him Dr. Ben Asaraf, and I really couldn't bring myself to calling him Baruch, so I had to devise schemes of how to address him, which were not very successful. But in the end, we became, uh, I wouldn't say Fred, he was always my father. And, and, and not only scientifically, my dad had died uh, before I came to Rook's lab, and in many respects he adopted me, and, and as he did with uh, many others. And it was a, a lifelong uh, relationship, which I hope has passed on to my relationships with many of my postdocs. Now, what did you set about working on okay. during the time in the Banassara okay. lab? So, when I arrived in Baruch's lab, this was 1964, so we already knew there were different kinds of immunity, immunity based on antibody, or often referred to as humoral immunity, and immunity based on cells, cellular immunity. People had discovered this much earlier. Much of it had come from the study of immunity to tuberculosis, for example, versus immunity which caused lots of antibody formation. So we knew that there were two forms of immunity, and uh, Jacques Miller and Bob Good were already working out the notion that they had a thymus that was important in certain forms of immunity, but not all forms. But we did not know that there were T cells and B cells. I mean, if you had sat down and said there must be such cells, you would have been right, but they had not been distinguished from one another. So what Baruch uh, proposed I do was to try to understand a phenomenon called carrier specificity. Uh, seems rather obvious today, but if um, uh, in immunology, uh, small molecules uh, by themselves don't elicit immune responses, but if they're conjugated or chemically coupled to an immunogenic protein, then the antibody will be elicited that reacts with the small molecule. So there's a distinction in the concepts of the ability to induce an immune response, often referred to as immunogenicity, and the ability to be the target of antibody, which is sometimes referred to as antigenicity. Okay, so the question was, what was the carrier specificity of anti-haptin antibodies, haptins being these small molecules, and how did it compare with the carrier specificity contribution of cellular immunity? So the notion would be, we'd immunize an animal with a conjugate of a, a, a nitrophenyl ring conjugated to a protein or a polyamino acid, we would elicit immune responses, we'd purify antibodies on the one hand, or cells on the other, we would confront the cells with the haptin on many different carriers and measure their response by determining their proliferation, their uptake of tritiated thymidine. And on the other hand, we would take the antibodies and measure 
equilibrium constants using, for the time, a very sophisticated method. So the T-cell response, well, it wasn't known to be a T-cell response. The cellular response was in exquisitely carrier-specific. If you conjugated a dinitrophenyl group to guinea pig albumin and immunize guinea pigs with that, the guinea pigs could respond to the guinea pig albumin, but they responded to the dinitrophenylated guinea pig albumin. But they made no response whatever to dinitrophenylated cow albumin. So the response was exquisitely carrier specific. By contrast, the antibody response was only modestly carrier specific. We developed a, a very um, a powerful technique to, well, we didn't develop, we utilized a t powerful technique to measure equilibrium constants called fluorescence quenching. And that led us to be able to determine what fraction of the total energy of binding of the haptin carrier complex was contributed to by the haptin. And the answer was, in terms of kilocalories per mole, 90 to 95 percent. So it was clear on quantitative grounds, we would clearly distinguish cellular immunity specificity from antibody specificity. So that's what my main project was in the Baruch Benasserif lab. I did several other things, but that was sort of the four-year uh, uh, odyssey, and uh, it paid off. Well, so NYU didn't turn out to be your scientific home right. for the long term, and you moved with Baruch to the NIH. Right, so the story there is also complicated. So uh, Benasserif, by the time uh, of 60, 1967, uh, was now established as one of the great young, younger figures in the field. Um, and, he, and, and Lewis Thomas, a man you and I discussed briefly before, he subsequently became the uh, uh, president of the Memorial Sloan, Cancer, Can Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and one of the great intellectual figures in modern biological sciences. Uh, had that time been the dean of the School of Medicine at NYU and a very close friend of Ben Asarev's. And he asked Baruch if he would be interested in being the chairman of anatomy. The position was vacant. It had been vacant for years. Baruch responded, yes, although he would like uh, to think of it as a department of cell biology. Uh, I can remember to this day that the search committee met and at the end of the day uh, they demurred and the, the fallback position was to offer Baruch a division of immunology that consisted of what he had. So he was furious <laughs> and said, well, it's time to leave. He had been told he'd be, he would be expected to be offered the chair of pathology at Harvard, but didn't, the offer did not come. Uh, he then looked at a lot of other jobs, and one of them was the head of the laboratory of immunology at NIAID. And normally that would not have been a job that would have appealed to him because he was very much into the academic life. But he had discovered uh, what would eventually lead him to become a Nobel Prize winner, the genetic regulation of immune responses by studying guinea pigs. And that was curious because, uh, although at the time, guinea pigs were much easier to work with than mice. And he had shown that there were certain uh, antigens that would elic elicit responses in some guinea pigs but not others. Careful breeding taught him it was a single gene involved that was a dominant. But he was having trouble making more progress. And the NIH had the inbred guinea There was one place in the entire world where there were unlimited numbers of inbred guinea pigs. And, uh, and moreover, there were two strains. One could respond and one couldn't. So this was made to order. So he, uh, he accepted the offer. And I, being a wonderful bargainer, walked into his office and said, Baruch, if you take me to NIH, I'll be delighted to go with you. <laughs> but those of you who may know him well, that was the most sophisticated way to deal with him. To try to argue with him on his own terms would simply lead to uh, a very bad outcome, but to be his person, there was nothing that was too good for you. But of course, I didn't realize that at the time. I had liked NIH, we had spent two years there, we had enjoyed it enormously. The notion of going back was very appealing. 
so I was delighted uh, to go back. Now, when you got to NIH, how did you set apart yourself from your mentor? Oh, so this was a, a di not difficult so much as, well, let me say challenging. So Baruch and I made an arrangement when, when we made this decision, and the arrangement was that I would work in collaboration with him on 50% of my time, and 50% of my time I could work on whatever I liked. Or, you know, reason, you know, so that seemed okay. And um, I, so we, we, we had, and I had two postdocs that came to the lab early, and one was working with me on my uh, projects, a man named Joe Davey, who turned out to be terrific. He subsequently was the chairman of uh, microbiology at Washington University, uh, served many important positions, already retired, but that's another matter. Um, and he, he and I worked together, and we did several good things together. So fortunately, uh, I was, quote, saved, if you like, or the solution became clear, because the uh, position at Harvard that he was told to expect, indeed, he was offered about a year later than he expected. He was offered the chair of pathology at Harvard Medical School, and it, it was, came within six months of, of our arrival at NIH. Within a couple of months, he had made his decision that he would go. He stayed another year in Bethesda, but he was already planning. And he asked me to join him. And I felt this was not a good idea because I had already realized the difficulty of establishing myself uh, as an independent person and to move twice with someone was sort of an announcement to the world. So despite the fact that I you know, greatly enjoyed working with him, and of course, you know, Harvard is a... Uh, enticing place. Uh, on the other hand, we really liked Bethesda, and um, we were happy there, and I had no idea what job I would have, but I decided not to go, and I told Baruch right away, which is one thing you had to do with him is, whatever you're going to do, tell him, and tell, don't tell somebody else, tell him, and he'll deal with it. He's, so that was fine. I decided to stay. He moved to Harvard. Uh, there was a hoo-ha about who would replace him, and uh, someone was offered the position, a good person, but I wasn't so sure about it, so I looked around for other jobs. Then that person withdrew, the NIH became a little desperate, and somehow I was offered the job. So I took it. <laughs> so at 34, I became a lab chief, and I am not absolutely certain, but I suspect I was the youngest lab chief on the campus. This was 1968. And you were still in the same so office. So same job. I uh, achieved my level of incompetence very early in life and stayed. So I have the same lab, same office since uh, Baruch moved out, July 1st, 1970. Did I say 68? July 1st, 1970. So he moved out June 30, 1970. I moved in July 1st, 1970. I'm still there. And so how did you set about putting your own stamp on the place and shaping the science? Well, so I was very fortunate again. So when we uh, were coming to NIH, um, the, the laboratory of immunology was not in a very good situation. So the history, there's a little history. The laboratory had been founded, I believe, in 1957. It was the first dedicated immunology laboratory in NIAID, and I suspect the first on the campus. And the man recruited to head it was a very famous scientist named Jules Freund. Amongst other things, he's known for Freund's adjuvant. And he was, he set up, you know, a first-rate program. He unfortunately contracted multiple myeloma and died about three years after he arrived. And his successor, who I won't name, had difficulties leading the lab. And the lab really descended into a hotbed of um, backbiting. And there were a couple of really strong programs, but many of the people there were not particularly uh, good scientists and not much was, it was, had become an embarrassment. So when Brew came in, he had a reputation from a distance of being a tough guy. Uh, those of us up close really knew better, but from a distance, so people left in advance of his coming, which was very fortunate because 
in government, it's not an easy matter to, uh, to uh, ask people to be reassigned. So, so over the two-year period he was there, he, what I would say, cleaned out the stables. But he didn't bring anybody in. So he left, and I was left with this open book. So Baruch had you know, left me the opportunity to build a program, uh, which I did. It took time. There was certainly, I certainly made false steps, but in the end, it worked very well. So I was very fortunate. I inherited what was basically the good parts of the laboratory from the past. One of my colleagues had come with us who was terrific. The rest was empty. Um, we had great postdocs, so I didn't even have to rush because the postdocs were producing marvelous work. Uh, I could move ahead with what I call deliberate speed, and in the end, it worked out very well. So you mentioned these postdocs, right. and you've had the great fortune of having some of the best immunological minds, at least in my memory. Right. Charlie Janeway, Laurie Glimsher, Mark Davis, just to name a few. So. Was it serendipity? Was it something about your mentoring style? How do you get the best out of your trainees? Well, two points. How did I get these trainees? That was serendipity. Uh, so Charlie Janeway arrived uh, the day Baruch left. Uh, he had expected to work with Baruch. <laughs> Charlie had, uh, came from a very distinguished scientific family. He'd worked um, during his work at Harvard Medical School with uh, John Humphrey, who was a great figure in English immunology, and another figure named Robin Coombs. He was clearly a talented man, and he expected to work with Baruch. He, I think rather surprised to discover he'd be working with me. But we got on very well. Um, he did well, but not as enormously well as he would prove to do when he was on his own. <laughs> So he, we were together for five years, terrific years, I think. Whether I prepared him for the future or he prepared me is a matter of discussion. I don't know. Uh, Lori came, uh, one of the few women who was uh, in, I, I don't know if she was a commissioned officer, but she was in a research associate position, which was, I can't remember any others because those positions carried with them the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, military, uh, you know, well, fulfillment of military obligation. But she and her husband at the time came and she was, you know, immediately showed her brilliance and also her independence of mind. And then the third of this trio, Mark Davis, that was the biggest surprise. So Mark had been a, a student at Caltech with a man named Leroy Hood, one of the great figures of our field. Leroy Hood was a great protein chemist. And the whole molecular biology revolution had occurred, and with it, the understanding of how the genes for immunoglobulins and antibodies were arranged. But so Lee realized he had to learn molecular biology, and he had two students uh, who had already had training elsewhere, and they sort of led his uh, group in that field. One was Mark Davis, and they had done Terrific stuff. All the work was published in the absolutely first-ranked journals. You know, Hood's lab, Lee, uh, Phil Leader's lab, and Sasuno Tonegawa's lab, which is leading the world. And Mark appeared. He uh, thought he was coming to visit, and he announced he wanted to be a postdoc in my lab. So I gulped <laughs> and said, well, certainly, but why do you want to do this? And the answer was he wanted to learn immunology, because although Lee Hood worked on antibodies, it wouldn't be said he was an immunobiologist, that he, that he had a deep understanding of the biology of the immune system, and Mark wanted to learn that. He came to me and to talking to others in, in, the, in, in the lab with a vision of how he could clone the T-cell receptor. And he laid out precisely the steps he thought should be taken. And they really seemed persuasive. There was, you know, to my great pride, to this day, I say one of the great achievements of the Laboratory of Immunology, which humbly, I believe, is my creation, was the achievement of cloning of the T-cell receptor. So while I don't personally benefit, I do in the sense that it's a ornament of achievement that I feel is of the first order. How does someone 
interested in cytokines and BNT cell right. differentiation, become the director of the Office of AIDS uh, Research. And in 1980 and 81, this new terrible disease started appearing. Young gay men who started to get infected with um, uh, <clears throat> this fungal disorder uh, that formerly was only occurring in patients who were immunosuppressed. Others were developing Kaposi sarcoma. Again, young gay men, what was going on? And people were dying. It, was, it took some time before we recognized the existence of a new and terrible disease. However, for the first four or five years, more than that, there was a lot of skepticism on the part of the um, advocacy community that the NIH investment in science was paying off. Um, with the discovery of the virus uh, by uh, Montagnier first and then Gallo, Many people may remember that a secretary of HHS named Margaret Heckler <coughs> confidently predicted we'd have a vaccine in a year, which we didn't. And so the advocacy community was just beside itself. And they started out using confrontational tactics, as most people know, you know. But after a bit, uh, some of the uh, members of ACT UP New York became convinced that this was not the way to go. That's, they were getting nowhere by blaming people for not curing AIDS. The only way we were going to cure it was to do the scientific work that was necessary. <clears throat> so they formed a group called the Treatment Action Group based here in New York City. And at about that time, there had been an, an international AIDS, uh, HIV Congress in Berlin. And this was around 19... 92 or 3, and people came back from the Congress depressed. Nothing great was announced. And everyone said, the system is just not working for us. It ain't work. The NIH organizational structure to support AIDS research is bankrupt. That was their view. It was untrue as events in the next two years, three years were to show, because in fact, the work was being done that would eventually lead to really great advances. But superficially, that's what it seemed to be. So they lobbied very actively with the Congress and uh, to the notion that all research resources for HIV should be put in a central location. There should be a single plan for uh, AIDS research. There should be a czar overseeing this, and that would be the way forward. Well, NIH hated this idea. It was antithetical to everything NIH stood for and opposed it. But the Congress passed it and put it into the NIH authorization bill, I guess. Um, and the notion was that all H funds for HIV research would be appropriated to the Office of AIDS Research. That actually never happened. But what always happened was in the language of the appropriations bill, while there was no actual appropriation, it directed that all resources be used in accord with the plan developed by the OAR. So in, in principle, the OAR controlled all the money, which was in those years between one and $1.5 billion, a lot of money. So then Harold Varmus had just become NIH director, and he was faced with having to find an individual to be the director of the Office of AIDS Research. So they had a search committee. I was appointed to the search committee. Um, people applied, but generally good people. I don't want to downplay any anyway, These were good, solid people, but they weren't great. Most of the big figures in the field for this, this was going to be a political nightmare, and they stayed out. But there was one person who was very interested, a man named Bernard Fields, who was uh, the chairman of microbiology and the head of infectious diseases at Harvard Medical School and a great figure in virology, and he was very interested. And the problem Bernie had had pancreatic cancer was in remission. And he was clearly a great choice. And the search committee was unanimous that he, you know, and he said, well, you know, I'm pleased if uh, my CAT scan tomorrow is clean, I'll be happy to accept it for the job. But the problem was he had a recurrence. And that put him out of the picture. 
he was the only viable candidate. Harold was, I won't say desperate, but so he looked around and I was the closest person. I used to say to people that my arm looks perfectly straight now. <laughs> So Harold asked me to do it, and I had reservations. First, I had never worked on the field, but that, to some, was an advantage, because I had no uh, access to grind. I knew immunology very well, so I was well qualified, at least at that end. And I have to say, I couldn't see how, in good conscience, you could say no. It's, well, this was a medical emergency. Um, there were probably a lot of other people who could have joined the job better, but they weren't around. Uh, it was a wonderful experience, just terrific. People were, the activist community, with a few exceptions, was terrific. Some of these people were just remarkable. I uh, had the greatest admiration for them. They're smart as hell. Uh, they understood NIH better than we did. And they were very anxious to see that only the best work was done. Uh, I had some run-ins with the people and the directors at NIH, many of whom I had known for a very long time. But not serious. Within a month or two of the time I took over at the OAR, um, a, a, a piece appeared in the uh, uh, CDC's uh, MM on mor mor morbidity and mortality report, describing the fact <coughs> that if you treated pregnant women with AZT and you treated the newborns with as well, you could reduce transmission from mother to child by 90% or more. Well, this was unbelievable. This sort of was like um, a new life began. People said, well, maybe research really is working. <laughs> and then a year or so later, the protease inhibitors came online. And now people felt that science really worked. And that really made, gave us enormous ability to push forward. Um, and I found it was a wonderful experience. And so for that role, you were promoted to a two-star admiral. Have you ever used that to get a dinner reservation or get in no. somewhere good? <laughs> no, the only thing is since I am a retired commissioned officer, I can get my medication at the Navy hospital across the street. And I have to go through their very modest security. And I have to show my ID, so I always get a very nice salute. If you had to do it all over again, and you couldn't be a scientist or a medical doctor, what vocation do you think you would have chosen? It's very hard to say. You know, I was very interested in history uh, to this day. But whether I would have ever chosen that as a field, I am, think, unlikely. It's hard for me to judge, you know. Um, I don't think I even have anything useful to say. But I thought you would ask me, what would I encourage a young person to do today? What would you encourage a young person to do <laughs> So today? let me give you a little history. So when I started in immunology, this is a great field. All this unknown stuff. Uh, you know, I think antibody-antigen inter inter antibody interaction, I could work on that. This is really terrific. And then about 10, 15 years ago, I began to think, maybe 10 years ago, you know, there's a lot more to be done. But the big ideas, maybe they've already been discovered. And if I had to counsel a young person, would I say, come to immunology rather than neurobiology or developmental biology? And I wasn't so sure. I could, because we had our eureka moment already. The clonal selection theory, in a sense, was immunology's eureka. It still underpins everything we do. It's rather like you know, uh, Darwinian evolution for evolution. Whereas neurobiology, who knows what causes consciousness? So the great problem still emerges. But in the last five years, I've changed my mind again. And, and I believe with the rise of systems biology, no field is better suited to take advantage of the new technologies to understand the true physiology of a system in humans to make predictions about them, to understand stratification. Immunology, the perfect science for this. So I changed again, and now I think it's a great field, and I encourage young, well-trained, mathematically oriented people to go into this. I think there will be great payoffs. And for disease, uh, unparalleled. I mean, immunology has already shown what it can do for uh, inflammatory diseases. Um, the cancer field is just breaking open its 
quite unbelievable. So I think immunology's impact on medical science uh, is beyond reproach. And finally, I would say immunology has done something in medical science that no other field has done. It has eradicated diseases, not just cured them, but eliminated them. The disease does not exist. That's never been achieved in the history of medicine by any branch of science other than immunology, with the eradication of smallpox, the eradication of rinderpest. Actually, two of the forms of, uh, of polio are eradicated. We still have the third form. We're getting polio. But those viruses don't exist in the nature any longer. So great field. All you young people, if I have to say something in a missionary form, this is a great field. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Bill. It's been a real treat hearing a little bit more about you. Well, thank you very much, and I hope it will be of some interest to more than my family. <laughs> <laughs>